I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. Welcome to Stand Up and Holler at the first in-season edition on this weekend's episode. We'll cover QB1 in transition. Defense, did they turn the page on 2020? Uh, week one thoughts and overreactions in a new segment we're going to call Truth or Emotion. And uh, look ahead early, very lo- early look ahead to the USF game next week. Uh, Will? Game one of the swamp. It was awesome to see a packed environment. I, I absolutely it just felt like football season all day yesterday, watching regular games with regular crowds. Uh, much bigger improvement on 2020. Yeah, man. Well, it started out with Virginia Tech on, on Friday. So obviously, I mean, I, I'm a Virginia Tech's my alma mater as well. So I enjoyed that when my dad grew up in Blacksburg. So uh, so that was fun to see them be able to be able to pick off an opponent there in North Carolina. And then and then you go into yesterday and you got Alabama, Miami. Unfortunately, that one was over about three minutes in. Yeah. <laughs> so I got, I, I got all hyped for the 330 game thinking, well, maybe this will be close. So then it was just a little bit bored. But, you know, hey, the 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 Georgia Clemson game was good. Then obviously when we get to see Florida play, that's that's the highlight of the day, even if we're playing Florida Atlantic. So obviously some things to clean up, but uh, a lot of things to discuss. So it's one of the things that Gator Dave likes to say, there's never a dull moment. And that is certainly true <laughs> with this fan base, this team, and, and with Dan Mullen. Well, let's jump right into it in two bits. And I, I wanted two bits to focus on whether or not we witnessed Anthony Richardson overthrowing Emory Jones as QB1 against FAU. But thankfully, Dan Mullen put that conversation to bed with a convincing interview with Cole Kublik last night on the SEC Network. When Kublik asked about the state of the position at, at Florida, Mullen said, what? what? Emory Jones? Are, what, what are you talking about? Okay. And and that really like uh, really put the conversation to bed for me. Clearly, Emory Jones is going to be the starter next week against USF, right, Will? I mean, he's going to start the game. I don't know if he's going to finish it, which is kind of what happened this week. I mean, look, I, I think I think Emory Jones struggled. I don't think there's any doubt about that. The two interceptions, the one was on a late throw where he was throwing down the field. That's going to happen. The one in the end zone was on a bad read that from the snap, he should have known not to throw that ball, especially being in the program for as long as he is. And, you know, the reality is you can't make those throws and continue to get opportunities. You know, when you got a guy over there, like Mullen knows what he's taught him, and, and I know he hasn't taught him that. And so, you know, if, if you were offsetting it by throwing for 300 yards and two picks, then you'd say, okay, well, we'll take the good with the bad. But he threw 27 times for 113 yards, 4.2 yards per attempt. He threw 12 times for 37 yards in the second half, 3.1 yards per attempt. They just were not able to move the ball downfield. When there were easy throws that were there, he wasn't able to hit them. There were times where I saw guys who were open where, you know, he just was locked on to his receiver. And again, those sorts of things happen. But if you're going to lock on to your first read, you got to get it out on time and you have to hit the guy in the hands. You got to be accurate enough to get it there. Otherwise, you're going to have games like this where it's frustrating. Now, I think you're, we're probably going to go here, but I'm not sure that Anthony Richardson's going to be a whole lot better through the air the difference is he was so electric last night especially on the ground and then he did hit the one play he had to hit right the 36 yard throw to weston on fourth down is a big explosive that all of a sudden you look at and say hey if he's going to hit those explosives through the air and be willing to take those shots downfield then then we really got something but yeah mullen sort of walked into this one he, he's been talking up anthony richardson all off season and people were getting excited and wondering hey you know there must really be something to richardson if he's talking him up and then we see that performance last Last night and say, eh, I think Mullen was seeing something all, 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 all along. And so um, I understand why people are excited. That 73 yard run was one of those where you're just like, whoo, like that's different. And I think that's the difference between the two quarterbacks. When I really think about it is that, is that when you saw AR out there, you went, that's different. When you saw Emory out there, you're like, I've, I've seen that before. And, and that's, that's, that's really the difference between the two guys. When, when Emory Jones committed to Florida back when Mullen, in Mullen's first recruiting class, I, I immediately was fired up. I could not wait to watch this guy's first start. And here he comes into his first start finally in year four. Uh, Kyle Trask, total surprise. Felipe Franks, Mullen, de, you know, Mullen doesn't throw the guy in early in his career. Okay, that's why Felipe Franks started. You could have all those justifications on, on why we haven't seen Emory Jones start to this point but I think you saw some of it last night where I'm not sure how many times during the Kyle Trask era, did we see Dan Mullen throw his hands up and say, what the F was that? Did we see that many times in the Kyle Trask era on terms of communication? I I, I think with Emory Jones, you, uh, 
you, you, you saw some of the, some of the, uh, you know, he's, he's just, it's his first start. It's his first start at the end of the day. So I know he's come in, he's played nicely in, in roles where we throw him in a little bit here and there, but that's a, he, the man made some mistakes. What can you say? He made some mistakes. He made some bad reads. I, I think with your assessment, I saw your article, check out Will's article on reading reaction assessing. Will has some great examples there of Emory Jones, even on some of the passes he's completing, He's turning down a wide open guy coming over the middle. On I, I think there's some situations where Mullen can sit down with the tape and Emery can absolutely get better if he's given the room to. The only problem is you have this guy who just looks like he's a transformational type of talent behind him. And I'm reminded of a situation back at Clemson a couple of years ago where you had Kelly Bryant, who was a good quarterback who led the Tigers to the playoffs the year before, get, over, get usurped by Trevor Lawrence. And I, I, I'm not I'm not calling Anthony Richardson Trevor Lawrence just yet, but I haven't seen a quarterback run like that since the last time a guy wore number 15 at that position in the swamp. I mean, he was he ran better than the guy who used yeah. to wear number 15 in the yeah. swamp. It was it wasn't particularly close. I mean, you know, there were the one where he hopped over the guy and turned it. It's funny, yeah. you were one play behind on the tape delay, and you said something about a throw that he made, and I go, just wait till the next one. <laughs> All of a sudden, right. you're like, Oh, okay, I see what you're talking about. Yeah. I mean, look, here, here's the reality is they had three expo- they had eight total explosive plays yesterday. Three happened when Emory Jones was on the field. One was actually Emory Jones' responsibility where he was able to run the ball on a play that broke down a 23-yard run in a, in a drive that ended in a touchdown. But the other two runs were a 31-yard David, Malik Davis run and then a 21-yard Malik Davis run that were explosive plays while Emory Jones was out there. And if I go just go all down the, the Anthony Richardson, a 20-yard explosive run on the play that ended up in the Emory Jones interception because he had his helmet ripped off. The 26-yard Anthony Richardson run for the touchdown on the same drive where he had the pass to Weston. Then you get the 73-yard Anthony Richardson run that ends up with the touchdown. Then a 22-yard AR run on, what was it, like third and 19? He runs for 22. And you just sit there going, no defensive back wanted to get in his way. That was the difference. I mean, the difference was is that every time he touched the ball, you could feel an explosive play coming, and you felt that the defense could feel the explosive play coming. And, you know, Bill Simmons always likes to talk about, like, when, when you – when you're thinking about whether the opposition is good, like when you're thinking about going for it for a fourth down, what you should think about is, does the defense want me to go for this fourth down or the opposing fans? Mm-hmm. And if the opposing fans are like, no, no, punt it, punt it, please <laughs> punt it. Then you're like, absolutely. I have to go for this on fourth down. That's what it felt like yesterday is FAU. Anybody who's a fan of FAU, all six of them were like, please, please, please put Emory Jones back in the game. And, you know, to be honest, yesterday his play really sort of warranted that. He, he, he was, But I think part of it is he was trying to stay in the pocket, right? They were trying to do certain things. They didn't have near as many designed runs it didn't look like. But there were times where you could see the defensive end crash and he still handed it to the running back instead of taking it around the end. Anthony Richardson didn't hesitate. When he had the opportunity to take it around the edge, he took it around the edge and, and it turned into 25 yards every time. Yeah, I, I, again, I'm I'm – I see the explosiveness with Richardson. I, I absolutely see everything that everyone else is seeing with Richardson on there. My only take on the on, on him as a whole is we did not get to see Jones. Most of what you're critical about with Jones has to do with the passing game. We did not get to see a huge sample size with Richardson in that department. And even the big completion, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't an awesome throw. The guy was just wide open. He pretty much just laid it in there for the guy. And the guy, the guy was pretty much just standing there on the ten yard line, caught the ball. Uh, I, I, I didn't see a ton in the passing game in general. But he didn't have to last night. So, in fairness to Richardson, he wasn't asked to. And so there's there, that. there's a couple things there is I am a huge one of the reasons I look at accuracy in high school and think it translates to college is because it means you're throwing to guys who are open. So the thing that impressed me last night wasn't the throw to Weston. It was that he anticipated that he was going to be open. And whether it's a good throw or not, when a guy's open by 10 yards, you don't have to be perfect. Mm-hmm. And that actually is the criticism when it comes to some of the things from Marie Jones is that when you feel like you have to rifle it in there and fit it in a tight spot in college football, at least I think that means you're throwing to the wrong guy when because there's always a guy who's open now sometimes that guy can't get to the end zone on third and goal sometimes that guy isn't going to be able to get the first down you just got to tip your cap the defense is going to win one but there's always a guy who's open and so I think that's one of the things that um 
that I saw in Richardson, again, is the anticipation of the guy coming open. That doesn't mean Jones isn't going to be able to show it. That, I think that's the thing is that everybody's going to take this as like an anti-Jones stance, whereas it's just something where we just saw. So we've been talking for years now at this point about how Dan Mullen needs to find a special elite quarterback to pair with his above average recruiting or, you know, sub sub elite recruiting for Florida. And that's going to be his path to a championship because that's what Auburn did when they had sort of recruiting in the 10 to 12 range as they bring in a guy like Cam Newton. That's, that's what teams like Oregon did when they were participating. You know, you get Marcus Mariota and all of a sudden you can sort of offset the, the recruiting that isn't quite at an Alabama, Georgia, LSU level. And what we all saw was hope that Anthony Richardson can be that guy. I don't think we got a lot of hope that Emory Jones can be that guy, but again, 10 rushes for 74 yards. If he can start putting it together through the air, if he can improve and put it together through the air, like all he needed was an average performance through the air. And it would have been like an elite offensive performance for Florida because of the way he was running the ball. So it's not like he's a stiff. If he's able to put a few more pieces together, then that's great. But the noise is going to get louder as Anthony Richardson sits over there. And, you know, those guys are both aware of it because they were both tweeting after the game support for each other. So it's good that that room's supporting one another, but at the same time, um, <clears throat> I can understand why fans are, uh, are excited about Richardson. That's for sure. My big question. And again, it's like, it's like I said before, we didn't, it, I'm not, I'm not critiquing Richardson. I'm just saying, a lot of the critique around Emory Jones is maybe some of the weaknesses in the passing game, whereas we just haven't seen it from Richardson yet, one way or the other, in my opinion. Uh, I think he, he deserves that opportunity, too. I'd like to see that happen against USF. But the big question, we hammer it home. We've hammered it at home all offseason. Dan Mullen is loyal to his guys that are, are, are the seniors. We, we saw it in the running back room. We'll get to that discussion later. We saw that in the running back room last night. Uh, but – Will Dan Mullen allow this to happen sooner than later, the transition from Richardson to Jones? No, I think it's going to actually take quite a while, and I think it probably should. The, the goal of 2021 is to figure out what you've got and figure out who you're going to move forward with next year. I, I don't think – you saw that Georgia game, uh, and, and you saw the Alabama game. I mean, Bryce Young came in and, and missed a couple of throws in the first drive, and from then on, that was just a slaughter. And I think if you had my, if you had Florida and play in Miami, I think we'd expect Florida to win, but I definitely don't think we would expect it to be what that was. I mean, that was just a complete whip by Alabama. So mm -hmm. you look at who's in the conference this year and, and the people that they have and what we have on our roster, you say, okay, I, I – this is probably a year where we can expect that those games are going to be rough. And so then the question becomes, what is your goal for the year? And I think your goal is to find that elite quarterback. Now, did he flash a little bit early? Is, is Richardson sort of pointing that he might be that guy after game one? Maybe, but you got to be sure. You, you can't dismiss Emory Jones just because he had one bad game, because if you did that, there would be other times where you, you know, Danny Werfel had bad games. Tim Tebow right. had bad games just because he had one bad game. Doesn't mean you dismiss him out of hand. And I think it, I think it's short-sighted to do so. And I also think that you're going to need both of them because the way they were running into defender defenders, one of them's going to get nicked up at some point in the year. And so you're going to need both of them. The other thing is a little bit of a logistical thing, which is that once they get past the fourth game, then there is no reason to transfer. Right. So if you can keep them both happy and this seems a little bit dirty, but if you can keep them both happy through four games, you've you've spent your year of eligibility. And so there's no reason to transfer if you end up getting benched and for either guy. Right. And so you kind of keep the the reps equivalent all the way through that fifth game. And then you can make your decision if you want to make a decision. And, and there's no there's no reason to go into the portal at that point. You stick it out as the backup and then and then go go somewhere else next year if that's what you want to do. That's another reason why I pointed to the Kelly Bryant, Trevor Lawrence situation. Uh, Dabo made that decision after that game at Texas A&M. It allowed Kelly Bryant to get into the transfer portal. I, I I wouldn't be shocked if we see something like that in this situation. But before we before we decide anything, we do. I'd like to see some uh, more samples here. I think we're going to see both play against Alabama in a couple of weeks. But I want to know from what you saw yesterday, what do you believe that Emory Jones does better than Anthony Richardson, and vice versa? So I think Anthony Richardson looked more decisive yesterday. When, especially when he was running the ball, he pulled the ball and was willing to run it. It seemed like much more. Um, I, I think from the standpoint of actually um, 
having a broader breadth of the offense, I think that's where Emory Jones comes in. And I think that's one of the reasons why Mullen is going to stick with him and wants to stick with him is he does feel like he's going to be able to execute more of the offense. Now, I think there were some limits as to that. I think they're probably going to pair that back a little bit, but you know, you, you saw as well as I did just about everything Anthony Richardson threw is either screen pass or downfield. It's mm-hmm. not as though he was going through seven progressions to get to his, to get to his dump dump down for, for those plays. It was, I'm either throwing it over to, to Rick Wells on a little screen pass or I'm chucking it deep. And, and that's not going to be a sustainable solution in the SEC over the course of the year. And so I think they're going to have to build the offense in to him. And that's one of the reasons why you have Emory Jones in there is even if he doesn't execute it as well as Kyle Trask, which was never a fair ask. But even if he doesn't execute as well as Kyle Trask, you've got someone who has the ability to execute it and to manage it. And that's why the interceptions are so disappointing. That's why the fourth down play that was just weird is disappointing because what you really need from Emory Jones is a guy who's going to manage the game and then take what the defense gives him and is able to do that because he's in his fourth year in the program. Now, again, is he pressing because it's his first start in the swamp? Is he pressing because he sort of knows he's got AR sort of, you know, creeping up behind him if if uh, if he struggles like those are all legitimate questions at the same time the interceptions are rough and the fourth down play especially is rough because that's you would expect the fourth down play to come from Richardson not from Jones based on their level of their their amount of time in the system right we're still this this is a great problem to have Gator Nation this is a great yeah. problem to have we could have used this problem a lot over the last decade hey, did anybody uh, watch Missouri yesterday like they, <laughs> they they almost lost to to the to the McElwain's there without McElwain he was out with like an appendectomy or something so hopefully hopefully he gets well but um you know you've got Central Michigan pushing Missouri Kentucky looked okay I guess I mean you know the 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 big boys in the SEC looked like the big boys in the SEC, but uh, yeah, I mean, th- those are the games that are going to matter this year. You got to make sure you're prepared for those. And like I said, these guys are going to get dinged throughout the course of the year because of the way they're being asked to run the ball. And that maybe is the other thing that we should think about, right? So Emory Jones had 10 carries in the game and, and Anthony Richardson had seven, but Emory Jones threw the ball <laughs> 27 times and only, and, and Richardson only threw it eight. And so the, balance between running and passing was different. And I suspect that was by intention because those are the things that Jones has to work on, right? Is he has to work on throwing the ball. Now, when it was 14, nothing and they decided, or yeah, 14, nothing. And they decided they wanted to put it away. They ran a play with 15. It was 15 plays, 11 runs mm. when, when Emory Jones is in there. And that does tell you something about where the confidence level lies um, within his ability to throw the ball down the field. 400 plus rush yards, didn't convert on two touchdown attempts inside the 10 yard line there with the goofy fourth down uh, miscommunication and the interception. The offense was just fine in terms of, if you want to talk about production, it wasn't clean. There's a lot to improve upon, but that's a lot of production on the ground. And uh, it's, it's like I said, it's a great problem to have heading into uh, week two against USF. Let's move on to four bits here. The other big question, how is that defense going to look? Will they turn the page on 2020? I gave you a couple of notes to start off here, Will, and I'll let you go. Uh, the defense, they held FAU to 353 total yards, 261 pass, 92 split, 92 rush yards on uh, 37 attempts, by the way. Pretty, pretty stout. Five of 12 on third downs, two fumble recoveries. Uh, one was a sack by Zach Carter on Nikosi Perry and uh, recovered by Gervon Dexter. Gervon Dexter also recovered a gift from FAU when they had a nice little drive going in the fourth quarter. It was just a bad exchange on a jet sweep. Um, in the first half, the defense, in my, my opinion, will let's talk about the first half first. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll do that first. We'll split it up in the halves here. The defense wasn't dictating much. FAU, three drives of 10 plays or more. The Owls had their chances uh, to make, but they, they just didn't have the playmakers to make the Gators fully pay. Uh, a solid example on the opening drive, uh, they put the running back out at, at, at a receiver, Johnny Ford. He runs right by Avery Helm, and Nikosi Nico- Perry just overthrows him. I mean, he had, he had a step on him. If it was a good throw, that's a catch, and he's either in the end zone or inside the five-yard line. Uh, I don't think the Gators will be as fortunate against more talented teams. No, I mean, so you mentioned that. That was that was sort of a theme. I think Helm got beat a couple of times like that, and they weren't able to take advantage. And then that drive ended in Florida territory after the quarterback and running back ran into each other on a on a 
on a handoff. They were trying mm-hmm. to do a mesh point and, and they just sort of tripped and fell. And it was a loss of four. The next drive ends in Florida territory on a Zach Carter strip sack. Awesome play by Carter, but at the same time, it's six plays a minute 47. You're in Florida territory and it takes the strip sack to get it done. I mean, hey, all power to you for the strip sack, but what are they doing in your territory? <laughs> Next drive, 10 plays, 451, and it ends. And, and, and again, it ends in Florida territory. They don't convert, but it ends in Florida territory on downs. And then the next one, 11 plays, 326 ends on downs. But again, in Florida territory. So all four drives for FAU in that first half ended in Florida territory. And thankfully, Florida was able to convert those first two drives into touchdowns because let's say they'd, they'd settle for field goals. Now you're sitting there 6 nothing going going into the half it's a little bit different a little bit different feel if you settled for a couple of field goals and had the red zone turnover and had the fourth down play and granted they got the touchdowns they were ahead I think they relaxed a little bit but at the same time you, the the thing for me is that this defense should have been angry they they have just been ripped by their own fan base all off season, deservedly so I mean and and you would expect that Mullen and Grantham would have just had tape of that LSU game or the Texas A&M game or something just on a loop in, in in the in the facility and that every time they were running a suicide or every time they were running a stadium that that would be in their mind that they didn't want to be embarrassed and that they wanted to go out on the field and show that last year was a was an anomaly and then FAU was four of seven on third downs in that first half they were playing off coverage every every possession was ending in Florida territory I mean you know I said this in my article, the first text I sent afterwards wasn't about Emory Jones and wasn't about Anthony Richardson. Like you said, I think we're going to be fine there, especially over time. But the thing that the first text I sent out was like, you know, I'm, I'm more concerned about the defense. For someone yelling at their screen right now, Will, can I point out that we had a shutout going in the first half? Does that make you feel any better? No, like I, I think, you know, when we play Samford, I'm, I'm going to expect to shut out in the first half, too. I think it's a question of expectations. Like you mentioned, things were open and Perry missed it. There were opportunities for FAU to take advantage. And, and I don't know why they were dropping behind the first down stick so consistently against a team that they Coverage. should be against yep. a team they should be able to press. And, and they just didn't do it. And then in the second half, they started to get burned. They didn't give up one explosive. If you, if you want to say, if you want to sing the praises of the defense in the first half, they didn't give up one explosive play. Mm-hmm. But if you want, but if you want to say that, you also have to say they were four, they gave up four of seven on third downs. They were actually much better in the second half on third downs. I think they wound up like five well, to 12 for the entire let, game, but they gave up five explosives there in the fourth quarter. Let's go on to the second half here. Uh, really uh, much better start overall. It was either three or four and out on the first five uh, drives. And, and this, this is where the Gators really put their distance in and separated, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read you what I the transcript of my pick for this week's game, Will. All right? I said the Gators are 23.5-point favorites in this one, and obviously I want to throw on my orange and blue and say we'll cover that all day. But I got burned a few times on these big spreads last year. Todd Grantham, prove it to me. I'm optimistic about the defense, but I need to see it. I'm going to take FAU to cover this spread at 23.5 thanks to the late touchdowns last year. If it was under 20, I'd take Florida all day, but that defense needs to earn my trust back. Might be looking at something like a 45 to 24 type of game. Pretty much exactly what happened in turn. Like we, we could have had a up, up in that range there with 45, but I, I, I tell you what, the late touchdowns. If you want to talk about Florida from a gambling perspective, it's been miserable with these big spreads the last couple of years here, man. <laughs> well, I mean, look, Anthony Richardson did everything he could. To help, to help me win that one. And, and the Florida defense and Todd Grantham decided to do everything they could to, to prevent that. But, I mean, they had opportunities. They had stops. They had personal fouls again. I pointed out in the in the article that it looked like Jadarius Perkins screwed up a coverage, that it was a zone where it looked like he dropped too deep and they were able to convert a long, I think it was like third and nine, on, on the first touchdown drive. And then they kept Perkins in. They hit a Hail, – not a Hail Mary, but they hit a jump ball down the field over to Revez Johnson. Okay, that happens from time to time. And the next play is the play where, where Jadarius Perkins pushes the guy out of bounds like five yards out of bounds bounds right just I mean and they're like oh it's kind of a loved up I'm like no he pushed him and, and he was way past the white and Perkins didn't come off the field and that that 
to me is is more indicative of the of the thing that would disturb me more than more than any stats more than anything else is that you see a guy on the field who's very physically gifted it's his first start for florida so there shouldn't be this loyalty that there was with marco wilson or with or with donovan steiner the guys that they had last year you see a, a massive mis- or you see a, a first mistake that then goes into a larger mistake you can't do that against Georgia. You can't do that against um, against Alabama. I'm not even sure you can do it against Tennessee because Tennessee is going to be able to score if you give them a couple extra a couple of extra downs. And and you know there there was no accountability last year. One of the things I don't think people were I mean people were upset about the Marco Wilson shoot toss. But the thing that upset people is that Marco Wilson didn't come off the field after the shoot toss. And I felt a little bit of that tonight, and and that that concerns me because that's something that I think we we want to see improved and want to see some accountability. Now that we've got all these guys who have a full spring practice and a full fall practice, which was the excuse last year for not taking guys off the field. Loyalty is typically noted as a good trait. Uh, my, my family is, uh, I have a Sicilian, Italian Sicilian background, so a big fan of loyalty over here. Uh, but is it a weird conversation that we're having with this Gators program with Mullen? I know it's been talked about once in a while, but even look at it, it goes back into the quarterback conversation too. Florida is a program, are we here to be, is everybody here to be fr- – I want to play quarterback for Florida too. I just don't have the talent, right? I, at some point, why are we not just playing the best guys playing and play out here and, and, and being loyal to guys uh, who are, are making, like you said, a bonehead play where you're pushing a guy out of bounds? Get get the hell off the field. Like, what are we doing here? And that, that was the frustration, the real frustration in the Marco Wilson situation is not so much that he did – he threw the shoe, that he just stayed on the field. Like, why are we not ripping guys off the field? Like, and, and I think that's – you kind of point to a key difference in maybe the, is there a lack of discipline that's keeping us back from that elite? Because we're really talking about a gap between being a good team and a great team now, and that's a really tough gap to fill. And, and I think that – so if we sound nitpicky at times, that's why you're hearing that from us because you look at Alabama. If, if a guy's pushing a guy five yards out of bounds, Saban's ripping that guy off the field in two seconds, right? Well, sure. But I mean, I, I think that sort of goes the whole way down. There, there have been a lot of people who've been upset about John Hevesy this offseason. I think they, they sort of ate some of their words during this right. game, right? At the same time, I think there are legitimate criticisms about Hevesy when it comes to recruiting. Um, same thing. I think people are rightly critical, including myself, of Grantham. Um, and, and there have been criticisms of Knox and things like that. But when you look at the program as a whole, there, there is a loyalty there. The question is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think, you know, if, if you think about like Virginia Tech back in the back in the 80s and the 90s with Frank Beamer, he had a bunch of really rough seasons to start out with and eventually is able to turn that program around. So you might say, well, you know, you people would have run him out of town if you'd have, if you did. But there's a difference, right? And the difference is that Virginia Tech was not recruiting at a lot. Virginia Tech didn't have three national championships and all that sort of stuff behind them like, like Florida does. And I, it, it was a bit of a uh, there there was some irony to having Steve Spurrier and Urban Meyer come out there in in one of the breaks and and then Dan Mullen on the side they're just different they're very different like Meyer was cutthroat Spurrier in some cases was as well right like I mean he goes out with a game plan where he's alternating quarterbacks every play right. he's that? got a guy, he's got a guy Danny Werfel who's one of the best best ever laced up <laughs> in Florida and and is just like taking him out whenever he makes a mistake right and and the the implication is is twofold one is that one mistake doesn't put you in my doghouse forever but it's gonna get you off the field Right. And you'll have an opportunity to go back on because, you know, that other guy's going to screw up, too. And when he screws up, you'll be in there. So it wasn't like a fear you were going to get yanked, but there was definitely a consequence. And that's the thing is that there are areas where there don't seem to be consequences and areas where there don't seem to be growth. If we were seeing growth, then we'd sit there and say, hey, the consequences are are taking place behind the scenes. And we're confident that those are being done. But the the fact that we're seeing similar mistakes, um, over and over again, there was one third down conversion where Florida wasn't lined up where I, I, I thought I was going to throw something. So, uh, you know, first game of the you year, didn't have any I, shoes I, around. Did you, you didn't have a shoe? No, but somebody made me a Florida, a Florida. It's a bomb that's blue with a big, with a big orange F. So I have an F bomb to throw at the TV. It's a little, it's a little plush toy. So that's what usually goes around the house when there's a, uh, when there's an issue. Oh, it's not your fault, Danny. It's my fault. I put you out there. <laughs> 
best quote ever from Spurrier. All right, well, let's move on to six bits. Uh, new segment called Truth or Emotion, where we'll make statements after our post-game raw statements, and then you tell us whether or not there's some truth or, or you're just being over-emotional about this thing. You need to chill out. All right, so the first one is – Will Florida Florida will struggle to pass the ball this season, no matter which quarterback plays. I think that's true. I think um, if Anthony Richardson was that much better than Emory Jones throwing the ball, he'd be in there because he's a, a dynamic enough runner and a big enough dude that I think if he was if he had separated himself throwing the ball in practice, I don't know that you would have been able to look your players in the eye and keep them keep keep them off the field. Yeah. And so I think what we saw is we saw Florida being able to limit his exposure against an overmatched team. And I think when you get a team that's out there and able to take away the running game, then you would see the struggles and maybe even more struggles than you see from Emory Jones. Now, obviously Jones struggled as well through the air. And so, you know, if that's your baseline, then, then that's an issue or at least maybe an issue later on in the year. But, but yeah, I think there's some truth to that. I think we saw tonight, this is going to be a running team, which, you know, hey, Gene DeLance had a great seal block on a on a run from Malik Davis to the out, outside. I know we're going to talk about it a little bit later, but you know, Malik Davis all of a sudden looked like Malik Davis from three or four years ago, and uh, you know, the offense looked completely different. The offensive line looked completely different. So I don't know that it's, it's the end of the world, but yeah, anybody expecting this team to pass the ball like they did last year is going to be disappointed. When are you going to show up on it with the number fifty six jersey? On, on an episode here we need we need that to happen well one of these episodes just it's coming home man when, when i go down for bama i'll have a 56 jersey that's what, let's I, should, go. That's what I should do let's go uh hey second statement this one breaks my heart a little bit you you referenced malik davis uh the running backs did look great last night so really credit to the guys who played uh, davis looked fantastic uh pierce I, he trucked that corner pierce pierce really got it did they say he squats 700 pounds Oh, geez. But so here's my next statement. Two guys we talked about all offseason that we didn't see a whole lot of last night. Demarcus Bowman or Lorenzo Lingard will not play a significant role in the 2021 season. Truth or emotion? I think that's emotion. I think these are the first the first game going out there. Malik Davis had it going. I mean, Malik Davis had two explosive runs in the first four drives. And, and you know, Florida was just running down to the red zone all the time. Damian Pierce had a really nice drive on on one of, and a couple of touchdown runs, but only had a long of nine. Right, Demarcus Bowman had a 15 yard run later on. I think you can start to see that you're going to, you know, there are going to be some opportunities, especially as the offensive line sort of asserts itself. The guy I think who sort of is going to be the, and we talked about this earlier during the offseason, the guy who's sort of going to get left out is probably going to be Naquan Wright. I, I think that's the person that you're probably going to see where maybe you got to start thinking about putting right on special teams to be able to get his shiftiness out there on punt returns or, or those sorts of things. But um, yeah, I didn't see anything like, you know, uh, last year when I saw Lingard run the ball, I really thought he flashed. I didn't see that last night, but you know, even though Demarcus Bowman had a 15 yard run, I don't really remember it. And so, um, you know, the, the things I remember are Malik Davis. The things I remember are the shiftiness inside where he was able to, so the offensive line did a great job of allowing the running back to get one-on-one with the safety. And when Malik Davis got one-on-one with the safety, he beat him three or four times. And that's where you got to get the explosive plays. Last year, they weren't even able to get the running back to the safety. There was a, there was a linebacker there. And then he had to beat the linebacker and the safety. And every running back's going to struggle with that. So, I mean, heck. How much I, do we credit Emory Jones for that change? I mean, I think there's some of that, but I think some of it is just the offensive line's better. I mean, you know, you, you look at they were designed to be a pass protection offensive line last year, and, and obviously Lance was not necessarily somebody who fit that mold, but Stuart Reese was awesome. Stuart Reese had a couple of pulling plays where he came by and he sort of shielded the running back from the linebacker, but didn't actually occupy the linebacker and was able to get to the safety then behind, or was able to get to the next man, maybe not safety, was able to get to the next man. So he took on two guys and then Davis didn't even have to beat anybody. So there, there were a few, there were a few plays out there where, you know, Malik Davis isn't getting touched until he gets, you know, six, seven, eight yards downfield. You give that guy that kind of running lane and, and you're going to see some, see some, uh, see some fireworks. But I think you say the same thing about DeMarcus Bowman, right? So I think we're going to see Bowman come in more and more as the year progresses. I don't think they gave him four carries for no reason. I mean, you know, if, if you take away Anthony Richardson, you take away Aaron Marie Jones, Bowman had the third most carries on the team. And so I do think that you're going to start did, to see that, that he's going to have more of a role as the season goes on. I think Pierce had six, no? 
Pierce yeah, Pierce, six. And Pierce is six for 31. Bowman was four yeah. for 20. Davis is 14 for 104. Yeah. Lingard, two for six. Wright, three for five. And I think yeah. when you think about the explosiveness of these guys, like four for 20 for Bowman, if you're getting five yards a pop, that's a guy who's going to start getting more play. Six for 31. Again, five yards a pop for Damian Pierce. You're going to get some play. But Malik Davis, 14 for 104. I mean, how do you argue with eight yards a run? Mm. Right? I mean, at some no, point, great. some point, like that's the guy who's going to get the ball. And there weren't any fumbles. There were a couple of times where he got popped pretty hard. Ball didn't come out. That's always been sort of the limiting limiting factor for Davis. Hasn't been his – it's been his health, and then it's been his ability to hold on to the ball. I mean, last year against A&M, you know, the fumble by Davis is what cost for – or one of the things that cost for to the game beyond the fact that the defense couldn't stop anybody. But, but Davis's fumble contributed to all that stuff, right? And so him being able to hold on to the ball, even though he's getting popped, is a big deal. And I, I, he's pretty clearly a starter at this point. We talked about it all offseason, the running threats at quarterback with either Jones or Richardson. That's going to open some things up for these running backs. So it's good, good to see that. Good to see the offensive line really, uh, really, really shine at points last night. Um, let's do a 2020 offseason favorite. We'll carry it into last night. Did the needle move? Did your fire Todd Grantham needle move at all last night? Like, it, it, you feel better about Todd Grantham, feel worse about Todd Grantham? Truth or emotion on that? Where are you at on Todd Grantham? I mean, I, I guess it's truth because I feel like I did at the end of last year when I thought I, the Grantham wasn't the right guy for the job. Um, you know, look, it is what it is at this point. When, when there was a great, I think it was Thomas Goldcamp had a great tweet. It was basically like when Grantham's rotations arrive on time, his defense looks fantastic. And there was a play where Trey Dean made a great play in coverage and was able to knock down a pass that, but it came out a little bit late from Perry. And then Dean got over there to, to, to guard it. And the rotation was there and everything looked great. A bunch of other times where the rotations were a little bit slow. And so, you know, they were able to convert some third downs that, Again, first game of the year. I don't want to overreact. It wasn't as though they weren't getting lined up repeatedly. There were some things that we saw from last year that carried it over. There were some things we saw from last year that were corrected. There's a lot of young guys out there. And I think we did see a lot more oomph from the defensive line. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of the things that we're going to have to keep watching as we go forward. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more pressure up the middle. At the same time, they weren't given a whole they, – they didn't give up a ton of rushing yards. Though if you look at just the running backs, they averaged about five yards a rush to just the running backs for FAU. So um, I think there's some things they can improve on. I'm not ready to fire him after this game, but he was already sort of the, – the fire Todd Grantham meter was already pretty high after that Oklahoma game last year. And so he's going to have to do some – he's got to do more than what I saw yesterday – to 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 get that thing to start petering down. Luckily, big number twenty one, Desmond Watson's helping put a smile on all of our faces when he steps on the field. Man, oh, I, there's I, nothing better than seeing him with twenty one on there. That's just great. Love it. Yeah, Fred Taylor, Fred Taylor, Desmond Watson rocking those twenty ones, man. I love it. Uh, all right, let's go on to the next statement here. Our defensive backfield will get shredded in an SEC play. Uh, I, I don't know. Shred is a little bit harsh. I, I think, uh, I think that's probably an overreaction. I think this is a lot of these guys first real playing time. And obviously when you got Tra Travez Johnson and Kyrie Elam and, and, uh, you know, so, some of the other guys, but uh, I think Marshall was out there, had a pass interference call, even though he's in the right place. That's something that's going to get better as we, as we go on and on Donovan McMillan, I think is going to get a lot more playing time at safety as the year goes on. I think Jairus Perkins is going to be better. Again, this is sort of his first real big time football. Um, so I, I, I think it's going to get better. Trey Dean looked pretty good at safety. I think having him at safety is going to be a significant boon for Florida this year. He's definitely more athletic than the guys that they had there last year. And, and Mordecai McDaniel had, had three solo tackles, six total tackles overall. So I, I think we saw some of the depth that we didn't have last year. There is an ability to rotate people in and out. Um, at the same time, it looked like Elijah Blades wasn't in there for the, for the second half. And so we already had the injury to Jadon Hill. That's maybe the question is if the depth gets even more thin as, as things go along, then we're going to have to see a guy like, like a Marshall really step up and be a lockdown guy as opposed to just, well, he's a true freshman. He's making mistakes. Um, at some point, you won't be able to have that if they, if they get another couple injuries there. Now, some of the coverage issues you pointed out where you talk about, I, I, and again, check out Will Miles' article on readreaction.com from Sunday here. The post-game analysis showed a couple of great examples of how on, on third down, the defense is playing back behind the first down line, basically. And I think, I mean, the idea is to let him catch underneath and come up and make the tackle. Maybe a guy takes a bad angle. Maybe there's a couple other things that go wrong. Maybe a guy plays it wrong. 
it's not as Grantham design necessarily, but you're still seeing some of those things that look a little odd to the eye. Are, are, are you thinking that's an issue with the defensive backfield itself or the scheme? I, mean, I think it, I think it's a little bit of both. I think, I think the, I think the defensive players are unsure of exactly what they're supposed to do. I think in the play that I highlighted in the article with Perkins, I think he sees a receiver going past him and gets worried real quick that he's actually responsible for underneath coverage, even though he's not. And so he ends up deeper than he should. And there's a crossing route in front of him and then he can't come up and make the tackle. So I think as these guys get more experience and as they start trusting each other and trusting themselves that they understand the scheme, that they'll be in better positions. But I said that after the first game last year, and it never seemed to materialize. And that's the thing that would concern me is, you know, again, last year after the old Miss game, I was very, I mean, obviously I was down that the defense had, had not played real well, but I was sitting there going, that's an anomaly. You know, Grantham's defenses get it. They get better over the year. Like I'm not a huge, I was, ne- I wasn't, I've never been a huge fan of Grantham, but still you're sitting there going, they're never going to be that bad again. Like they were against old Miss. And then all of a sudden against Texas A&M, they were just as bad. And then all of a sudden against, um, you know, even against the Tennessees and the Kentuckys of the world, they couldn't get off the field. And that's going to be the thing, right? Is we got to figure out um, is, are they growing over time? And I think that's what you need to ask, right? I mean, I, I think you look at it, you say, this is what I'm seeing in game one. The question is, is it still there in game two? Is it still there in game three? Is it still there in game nine? If it's in game nine, then that's a player issue. I think if it's, if it's, uh, if it's, and you gotta give Grantham credit, if it's not there in game nine, at the same time, you got to hold those players accountable. And then that's a Grantham issue. If you're still seeing it in week nine. All right. Final statement here. Anthony Richardson is the only shot the Florida Gators have at winning the national title. I think that's emotional, but it's not too, it's not too far off the truth, right? I mean, you, you're going to need an elite quarterback play to, to win the SEC. I mean, I think even Tennessee, or I think even Alabama has shown that, right? I mean, they, now granted every one of their quarterbacks from the last like decades in the NFL right now, but along with all their wide receivers too, but um, you know, the reality is, is that Saban's made a change. They showed a great graphic yesterday where basically up until the last three or four years, his teams have averaged something like 34, 35 points a game. And over the last three or four years, they've averaged 47, I think was, was the graphic. And he, he's made a conscious decision, right, to open things up, to bring in guys who are going to chuck the ball over the place. And he's OK winning 47 to 24. He, he, he is OK playing that game. He's made that adjustment. Now people are going to have to adjust to him. And one of those adjustments is, is that you could, you could get Saban with a guy like Johnny Manziel a decade ago. I think a team like Texas A&M with Johnny Manziel is going to struggle to get a Saban team right now because he's got his own guy over there on that side who's, who's, who's a dynamic playmaker. And so, yeah, you're going to have to have a guy who's like the best quarterback in the SEC to really win a national championship. And, and I think one of the things that we saw is it's hard to imagine – that Emory Jones after after the first game is going to be the best quarterback in the SEC. It's pretty easy to imagine after seeing Anthony Richardson um, run like he did that if he can take that next step in the passing game, he could be at some point the best quarterback in the SEC. But it's not going to be right now. And so I think you know it's it's completely understandable that that Emory Jones would play would be the starter and would get the lion's share of the snaps. At the same time, um, you know we're all we're all we all saw it, right? We all saw the flash definitely last night. And we all saw that that's the hope eventually long-term and, and, you know, so that's sort of the dichotomy there. Well said, well said. All right, let's move on to a dollar. We'll do a USF look ahead very early. I know it's, we're recording this on Sunday. So <laughs> I right, let's, let's go over, let's go over exactly the, the profile of the bulls here though. This is, this is for Florida. It's going to be the first, non-FSU related true non-conference road game since 2013 Miami before that you have to go back to 2003 when they went to Miami and then 1991 when they went to Syracuse Florida just does not play on the road a whole lot in the non-conference outside of Florida State but that's going to change here in the next decade so just just interesting I had to look that up last night because I was curious about that uh 2010 was last time these two met Gators crushed USF 38 to 10 in Gainesville. Uh, this is the first of a three game series. The next two will be in Gainesville thoughts on the state of the USF football program right now. It's been pretty bleak since the days of, of Jim Levitt and in the late two thousands in the big East. And I know Willie had a good run there for a couple of seasons, but after Levitt skip Holtz comes in was pretty much a bust at USF. 
Taggart struggled for a few years before he finally found his rhythm, ends up bolting for Oregon. Charlie Strong comes in, did not inherit a bad program from Taggart. He, Taggart had hauled in the top recruiting class within the American Athletic Conference for three straight seasons, and they really they ranked as high as 42 nationally one year while we're rebuilding the Bulls from dismal tenure under Skip Holtz. Taggart took USF from a 2-10 and 10 season in 2013 to an 11-2 program before departing uh, for Oregon. You enter Charlie Strong, ends up winning 10 games in year one, but he had the benefit of having uh, Quinton Flowers and those strong recruiting classes from Willie Taggart. USF took a huge nosedive after that. Uh, really the last relevant game they played uh, in, from a national perspective was that 2017 Friday after Thanksgiving game where they went up to Orlando and uh, played the U UCF to a 49-42 to loss. Strong's recruiting classes were mostly in the middle of the pack of the AC, AAC, but he took some big swings and misses at quarterback and really crossed the board, and the, and the roster has really suffered since then. So on top of that, you have UCF rising while USF has plummeted. So that's been pretty difficult, even though the programs on, on paper, if you don't know a lot about them, you would think they're pretty similar, but they're completely night and day in terms of where they're at financially and where the facilities are, everything else. It's been, like I said, it's pretty bleak days for USF football. Jeff Scott comes in from Clemson as the offense coordinator, the uh, co-offense coordinator with Tony Elliott there at Clemson, has had plenty of interviews, plenty of opportunities to leave, chooses USF as that opportunity to jump on. They announce new facilities. There's always quiet talk of an on-campus stadium. This is still very much a growing program. Jeff Scott, I think he's doing some good things there, but he's been one in nine since he's been there. The talent is just not there. They opened up with a 45-0 loss to NC, NC State uh, last week, Will. And even though there's some optimism in what's been a pretty stale program the last few years, Jeff Scott has a long, long way to go in rebuilding this roster. And I'm not expecting much of a challenge in, in the way of competition from the USF Bulls next week when Florida takes the field at Raymond James Stadium. Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of it kind of depends on what they do at the quarterback position. So Cade Fortin comes out and goes 7 of 20 for 41 yards as the starter with a Not pick pretty. in that game against NC State. And then they bring in Timmy McLean, who actually showed a little bit, right? 7 of 13, 126 yards, but had two picks. So his QB rating, not all that great. But at the same time, it's not as though Fortin was really like this guy who's been in the system and just had a stinker. I mean, he was 4 of 8 last year for, for South Florida for 39 yards. He was 32 of 65 for 388 yards as a freshman at North Carolina. So really not any sort of history that he's going to be halfway decent. So I expect, and I don't know, but I would expect that USS probably going to go with McLean at quarterback just because he didn't look awful against NC State. But what does that say, right, that you start Fortin in the game and when the lights come on, he just, you know, just awful. Um, you know, the bigger problem is they gave up 45 points to NC State. And, you know, NC State is a program that has sort of been up and down. And, you know, obviously when they had Phillip Rivers, they were pretty good and they were decent when they had Russell Wilson. But it is interesting that when Russell Wilson went to Wisconsin, he all of a sudden became Russell Wilson at NC State. He wasn't really able to do that. Um, you know, pretty good quarterback in Devin Leary, but not not somebody that I'd sit there and go, oh, this is going to be a guy who wins a Heisman. Still, NC State puts up 45 points. So, yeah, I think when you look at the USF game for Florida, this is a tune-up, right? This is an opportunity to get confidence going. It's kind of fun because you get to go to Tampa. It'll be a different different environment, but you'll have all the – it's going to be a Gator home game even though it's in Tampa. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think what, what we want to see is all the different things that we've talked about, right, is the improvement on defense, the accountability of the guys on the defense side the ball Emory Jones throwing the ball a little bit more I'm sure we'll get sure we'll get some explosive plays from Anthony Richardson and then I'm guessing they're probably going to give Richardson especially if they get up early that they'll give Richardson a little bit more of an opportunity to throw the ball so that'll be fun to see what he can do when when they start to open up the offense for him a little bit but uh yeah when your starting quarterback goes seven for 20 for 41 yards um you you're, you're gonna struggle for comparison's sake I think FAU has a better roster this year and yeah. I, I don't think it's a reflection of what Jeff Scott is going going to build at USF, but I think we're a good couple seasons, a couple of solid recruiting classes away from that. So nothing to worry about Saturday for the Gators, in my opinion. Uh, let's talk about what we want to see improve, though, over from the FAU game to game two here. For me on offense, let's start with the offense, Will. The number one thing, the passing game. 
I, I, it's a huge concern heading into Bama. If you want to put on your freak out hat for a second, uh, we talked about the running game is fantastic, but you'd like to see either Jones or Richardson inspire a little more confidence in that passing game. Otherwise, Alabama is going to – I mean, it's the Alabama buzzsaw, right? They're going to come in here. They're going to load up in the box and force us to pass the ball anyway. You'd like to know that we're not going into that game totally one-dimensional. What do you think about that? I mean, look, the leading receivers yesterday, Rick Wells had five catches for 36 yards, and Damian Pierce had five catches for 25 yards. Those are the two guys who caught the ball the most. And then you got Whittemore with one catch for 18 yards, almost an explosive play. Whittemore was open a lot and got missed. Copeland, one catch for 15 yards. That's the guy you sit there and say, hey, we need to get him the ball four, five, six times a game. Justin Shorter, four catches for 11 yards. They only throw him screen passes. And, you know, he's he's the guy who sort of came open on the original on the initial throw to Copeland that I thought he could have gone for a really long way. So you can only design so much, right? At some point, the quarterbacks have to take advantage of it. And, and there were some opportunities to do that. So that that I would love to see a drag route across the middle get completed. Like if, if you told me, what are you really looking for a drag route across the middle when they've got, when they've got man to man coverage or when they drop a zone way, way beyond the first down marker, let's hit that play. Right. Because that's the play that was open last night, a bunch and, and sort of went away from it. I'd like to see the ball not fitting into tight spaces. We let, let's, let's find the guy who's open. And even if we miss him, Let's make sure we're throwing to the right guy, and it'll be okay. You're going to miss a few of those throws. In fact, they said on the telecast that, that Dan Mullen had basically said, look, he's not going to be as accurate as Kyle Trask, that Emory Jones is going to miss some of those throws. We're going to live with it because of the other things that he does. Fine, but let's at least be thrown to the right guy, right? Let's make sure he's open. If we airmail him or if it's too low or something like that, hey, we'll live with that, but let's get it to the right guy. So those are sort of the things I'd be looking for. I don't know that you're going to see that necessarily in the stats. I think you have to chart it, right? This is one of those where I think to really legitimately have – criticism of a player that you're going to have to chart out every throw and say, okay, what, what was the concept? What was Florida trying to do? Did he do something within the constraints, within the constraints of the offense? And then how quickly was he able to make a decision to go from, nope, the first read's not open to I'm running or, Hey, I went through three reads and then it's not open and I'm running. And Mullen actually coaches these quarterbacks in certain instances to only have one read and run. Right. And so uh, again, it becomes difficult to understand like you knew that wasn't the way he was coaching Trask, right? So if Trask locked onto a guy, you went, okay, that's a problem. I don't know that that's necessarily a problem with, with Jones. I think sometimes you want him to lock onto the guy. If a guy doesn't come open, go run. Although we did, we did see that one route get jumped yesterday. That was almost a pick six for FAU uh, when, he, when he locked on the guy in the flats and it was a little bit late in that throw. But the lateness is the problem, not the locking yeah. on, right? It, it's yeah. it's the so it's the, it was the same thing with the Good pick point. on the because he it did was the, kind of go away and come back to it, didn't he? Well, and yeah. it's and it's the pick on the 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 one where the defensive back cut, cut underneath, right? That mm. it wasn't that it was that the wide receiver ran out of real estate, had to slow down. The defensive back cuts underneath, and you get the interception. I'd love to see the all twenty-two on that one because I think it'll be telling. Because I think there's probably two guys running wide open on the other side of the defense based on based on where that ball went, but. Uh, Anyway, I mean, I, again, I, I think there's going to be a lot of criticism whenever a quarterback throws for four point something yards per attempt. Well, I, I think we need to see that up around seven, right? Seven is the average. Are we going to come out with a similar game plan? We know this team can run the ball. I don't, I don't, I think that Mullen just wanted to run his best offense yesterday, and it was proven. We suspected they were going to be very solid run the ball, 400 plus yards. Awesome. A lot of big explosive runs. Do you think Mullen goes into this USF game knowing he's got that huge talent advantage, knowing that Bama's around the corner and that we're going to be just working on that pass again against USF? Do you expect to see the same type of commitment to the run, or do you think we're going to drop back a lot more? I mean, I, I think it'll be pretty equivalent. I mean, if you look at it, they had, they had 46 runs and 35 passes last night. So it's not as though they – I mean, they were, they were unbalanced towards the run, but it wasn't, like, ridiculous. I mean, mm -hmm. it was, you know – 55 percent which is kind of what you expect right you expect that that's what florida was under felipe franks then when kyle trask came in and showed an ability to throw they sort of flipped it and all of a sudden we're 55 percent pass and hey now we're back right we're, we're back to 55 percent run I, I think what you're going to see is that whenever you run the ball running inherently gets you less yards than passing you're less explosive and you have to be able to convert on third downs and you have to be able to get yourself in down in distances that are e easily convertible and again, I, th there's there's an awful lot of criticism of Jones, and I think part of that is the excitement around Richardson. 
but they were in the red zone the first four drives. They just didn't convert the last two, mm-hmm. right? And the, and the last two that they didn't convert on were pretty clearly Jones's fault that they didn't convert on. So that, I think, is maybe the thing where you focus on if you're trying to really boost him up is, hey, in that first half, that game's 28 nothing. If you do your job on these two plays, or it's at worst 20 to nothing if you do your job on these two plays. And so um, those are some things that I think uh, think Florida will be working on. I, I think I think decision-making is going to be the thing that they work on, which, d- yes, does mean they're going to have to drop back and throw the ball a little bit more. But he's not going to change who he is, right? I mean, they got to be prepared to play Alabama with the offense that they have. They've spent all fall camp you know, experimenting. Now the games are, the games are here. They're live. You got to put game plans together and you got to get guys out there and see what they can do. Now, what I think they're going to be able to do is go back and look at the tape and say, okay, Emory Jones doesn't do that. Well, he did this. Well, let's make sure that we start doing more of that. Let's confirm that he does that. Well, and then, and then we'll sort of build off of that. So that's, I think maybe what they'll do is they'll, they'll focus on the things that they think he did well from the FAU tape. And then they will try to maybe build around that for the USF game. And that way you'll be able to build around that for the Alabama game. That's an offensive focus defensively. I'd like to see the continued development of the interior defensive line. We heard a lot of those names being called out. Dexter, I mean, we obviously saw Watson in there. I didn't see Watson make a ton of plays, but he just, just seeing the man on there was good enough for me yesterday. Uh, but Newkirk. Valentino heard their names called called out a few times last night. They were in the causing some chaos up the middle there. Even when they weren't making the play necessarily, they were causing uh, they're they're creating issues in the backfield and allowing someone else to clean up, which is what you want to see out of your guys up the middle. But in Atlanta last season, well, Bama did whatever they wanted. And again, I I don't mean to look past USF here, but that's the real focus. We want to see what this team's going to be for Bama, and I hope. Grantham's defense is focused on shutting down the run right now because against Bama, we want to at least make them – we want to be able to stop one phase of the game, which is nearly impossible. We didn't see Miami do it at all yesterday, but I'd rather put the game – the ball in the hands of the million-dollar man. Let that freshman quarterback try to beat us, and if we can at least – if that defensive line plays good on Saturday, we can at least have a little bit of hope going into that Alabama game next week. Yeah, I mean, so I, the thing I'm actually looking at is Nikosi Perry threw the ball 33 times. Florida had one pass breakup. So if you're pointing to the – yeah, the defensive line could get better, better push, especially up the middle against in the running game. I think the linebackers played okay. There were a couple of times where I felt like they jumped out of gaps, even though there was, wasn't really a reason to. Um, but we saw Tyron Hopper. We saw Derek Wingo. We saw Diabate, obviously. We saw Ventral Miller. So the depth there, I think, is a lot better. So if I was pointing to something I wanted to see against USF, you know USF doesn't have very good quarterback play, right? I mean, we just went over a guy with 7-20 of 20 in, in, in the first half the other day. So, you know, USF's going to struggle throwing the ball. And, and so um, the thing that I want to see is I want to see defensive backs playing up. I want to see them contesting. I want to see some pass breakups, which, you know, four or five, six pass breakups over the course of the game, because you need to see them aggressive, especially when Alabama comes to town. If you just give Alabama third and fours the whole game, game over. Like Bryce Young is is just going to pick you apart because they're going to be in third and four a lot because they're able to, especially if you stop the run, because they're going to be able to get three, four, five yards of pop. And all of a sudden you're sitting third and two, third and three, third and four. If you're not willing to come up and contest, then I think it's going to be a really long day. So that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see more pass defenses from the, uh, from the defensive backs. And uh, you know, Hey, if you get burned a couple of times, you get burned a couple of times, but be aggressive, get up there. And you know, you might get a couple of penalties too, but let, let's live with it. Right. We got to start contesting more when the ball's in the air. We saw it with Travis Johnson again, one of those jump balls down the field that Florida sort of went up for behind the defender instead of cutting underneath and, and knocking the ball out. We need those sorts of balls to at least be 50, 50. If they're 75, 25 towards the offense, it's going to feel a lot more like last year's defense. 35, 14 victory for the Florida Gators over the FAU owls in a packed swamp last night. It looked great by the way. I I didn't hate the white at home. What'd you think about the white? I mean, <laughs> I, I like the blue. I'm always partial to the blue. Yeah. Um, if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna do it, go snowflakes, right? Put the put the white uh, white helmets. Put, put the white helmets on to go ice, yeah. I guess. Go ice with the white helmets. But hey, man, it's a win, right? It's a win, and those are you know we. <laughs> 
We saw Miami get absolutely blitzed. We saw we're going to see Florida State tonight play Notre Dame, and we'll see if Mackenzie Milton is is even a shell of what he was a few years ago. I hope he actually plays pretty well. But um, you know, at the end of the day, I think the Gators are in a pretty good position. I think we all sort of see there's some things and some warts that they need to do to take that next step. But that's what we're that's what we're criticizing, right? Is how do we take that next step? Right. Not where the program is, because I think the program is sitting in a place where the floor of this team is nine and three. The question becomes, how do you get to eleven and one? How do you get to twelve and zero? And what we saw in some places yesterday ain't going to get you to twelve and zero. But there might be a path there, so that's exciting, right? That we get to see that there that there might be a path. Yeah, and, and all the talk with Emory Jones and Anthony Richardson. For the record, we would have killed to have an Emory Jones over the last decade, <laughs> but they're I just mean, here at the same time. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I mean, it's not uh, – love Emory Jones, love the time he's put in the program, but, like, if 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 you're getting outplayed by the other guy, you got to you got to take a serious consideration there. So, it's my final thoughts on that quarterback spot before we jump in to the next week, Will. Yeah, hey, man, it's going to be fun, right? I mean, U.S. Uh, one more week, that's sort of a tune-up. And then, uh, and I'm coming down, buddy. I am going to be there for Bama Lock, Stock, and Barrel, and uh, it's it's gonna be a blast. Roll miles, let's go, let's go. All right, thanks for everybody. Thanks to everybody for tuning in for another episode of Stand Up and Holler. We'll be back next week after the USF game. In the meantime, go Gators. Thank you for watching this episode of Stand Up and Holler. Be sure to subscribe to the Read and Reaction YouTube channel. Join our Patreon community at Read and Reaction for bonus content each week. And check out our website at readandreaction.com. I'm Nick Newton, joined by Will Miles. And as always, go Gators.